So I want to say thank you for coming and I'm glad that we're going to have this opportunity to do this uh, class. We are at the Dhammasukha Meditation Center in um, Annapolis, Missouri. And my name is uh, Sasana Depika, Sister Kema. And I am uh, in training here with uh, Venerable Vimala Ramsey. And one of my pet projects here is to study dependent origination and find different ways to present it to people so that they can understand it in a way where you can use it in daily life. Now, um, I know that you, you teach in another area in the United States, so it's fun to share with you um, some of what we have figured out as uh, ways to teach people this so that they can remember it. And the Buddha said basically that in order to study dependent origination, that the person must have the voice of another to help them to learn the parts of it. Now, for those of you who have not been with, uh, involved with Buddhism very much or understand about dependent origination, I'm going to show you just a couple of things um, to start out with that gives you, I had pictures here and it gives you an idea of what they have done in Buddhism to demonstrate um, what is happening to you when you have a lot of suffering and how the suffering happens is what the Buddha was talking about um, when he taught dependent origination. And this is the wheel that the Buddhists call the wheel of samsara. And the wheel is composed of 12 links that we're going to talk about today. And these 12 links, uh, now in Buddhism, on, we're going to, what we're going to do here is we're going to build the links and we, when, by the time we're finished, we want to understand what the links are, um, how they operate, which ones we can see as we are practicing our meditation, and which ones we shouldn't try really, really hard to see in the process of learning about them, okay? Because if we struggle in our meditation at all, part of what we are trying to do is just let go and relax all tension and tightness in our minds and in our bodies and open up our mind. We're trying to purify our mind by retraining our mind. So by the time we're finished, you're going to understand what does it mean to purify the mind and what does it mean to retrain the mind and did the Buddha actually have a way to retrain mind that could be used all the time in the uh, person's life, not, not just on the pillow. And one of the most important things to understand for meditation today, it doesn't matter what kind of meditation that we're doing, is to understand that meditation is not meant to be an escape from life. It is actually meant to become part of life. So if we're practicing and we're going away to experience um, some of the bliss or happy or good feelings that we're having, but we do that more than we partake in life as the lay person, structurally we're not operating very well sometimes in life. So when we're through, hopefully you'll see there can be a lot of fun with this for the lay person, for the family, for the children, for anybody, you know, to be able to learn a simple system of what they called in the texts right effort. And this purification had to do with beginning to understand what is an unwholesome mind state. It's one that causes tension and tightness. And what is a um, wholesome mind state is one that was there wasn't any tension and tightness and the mind could open up and be free to hopefully come up with peaceful, creative solutions for life so that people could more easily, peacefully co coexist. 
So the first thing I want you to do is to take your paper and we're going to start with a blank paper and what we're going to do is we are going to, on the back side, look at the Four Noble Truths very briefly here uh, for a moment. Okay. So we write up in the left corner the Four Noble Truths. There, there, is, there suffering, is suffering, right? There is suffering. We take the very basic version of this. And number two was there is a cause of suffering. Number three is there is a cessation of suffering. And number four is there is a path to the cessation or a way, path or you can put a line and say way of it after it. Okay. Now, if you just draw like a reverse arrow here for a minute, I want you to look at four different things, four different ways that Traditionally, Buddhists use this Four Noble Truths, and it's really interesting. First of all, of course, it's the outline of the Dhamma. It's a brief outline of Dhamma, and Dhamma means truth. So it is the Buddha's truth. It's the outline of the Dhamma. The second point is it is the actual plan for your investigation when you're doing meditation. That means when you go in to your meditation, you are looking at a particular, suppose you are practicing one of the foundations, four foundations of mindfulness, you would say, what is the body? What is the cause of the body? What is the cessation of the body? And what is the path to understanding completely what the body is? You might look at it that way. So this is how he used this as a plan for his investigation when he was doing the meditation. Okay, the third one is, this is an outline for teaching. So it's an outline for teaching the Dhamma or for, or for writing a Dhamma talk. If we stick to the pattern of this, uh, you'll find in the Majjhima Nikaya, which is the principal book that we use with Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation from Wisdom Publications, you will find that out of the 152 suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, most of them have at least three and sometimes four of the Four Noble Truths in them as a pattern for teaching. So there's a subject presented and a question is given about that subject and then there's a causal thing that is figured out and he explains the solution to this thing in keeping with the precepts and the Eightfold Path that's how he explains the suttas that are found in the text. The last one is especially for the lay person. The lay family has a four-step solution pattern to use in life. And we just say it's a four-step solution for life because if you have a family and, and there's a problem and you sit down as a family, one of the best ways to solve it is, okay, say, what's the problem? Okay. What do you think the cause of it is? And you share with each other what the cause of it is. And you look and say, what do you think the solution is? What do you think the solution is? What do you think the solution is? And then what happens is you come together and look at, can we make this solution happen with the guidelines of, keeping in the guidelines of the, um, the precepts and using the Eightfold Path completing the requirements in the Eightfold Path as we do this. Can we do this with wholesome imaging in our mind? Can we have uh, an impersonal perspective when we do this? Can we uh, do this in a systematic way where we're practicing it all the time? So he gave us this to work with. Okay, um, the second thing I'm going to ask you to take a look at, um, just to take a look at this, um, I'll give you a copy of this, and on the top of this is a this is a uh, diagram that we use when we're teaching dependent origination that we have uh, have developed. And using this, okay, using this chart at the top, you'll see that dependent origination is become has become quite complex over the years. And there are different ways of looking at it.
if we were to look at dependent origination in a microscopic sense, what this is pointing out to you is that's not really helpful to you and me in daily life right now today. So it's not useful to talk about it that way, okay? But the other way that seems to be studied in a lot of the uh, traditions or texts is we see discussions in the commentaries in reference to three lifetimes. Now this is an interesting way of looking at it. We're looking at it vastly macroscopically now, okay, across a broad expanse. And in some respects, um, there was Buddha, Venerable Buddha Das that came forward and said, well, that's not right. That's not even Buddhist if you're talking to me about actually you need to learn this to understand the Dhamma, but this is going across three separate lifetimes, and since the Buddhists are not eternalists, and you don't personally come back, this gets, you know, a little bit convoluted here, but okay, then how can this be Buddhist? But in the second way of looking at this macroscopic view, what if the statement of three lifetimes actually didn't refer to that and actually referred to this moment and the next and the next, or this period of time and then another period of time, another period of time. Lifetimes can be lifetimes of moments, lifetimes of minutes. This gets fascinating. But still, that's sort of obscure from you and me in everyday life. So we thought about this, and we've been talking about it a whole lot over the years. I've been doing this for close to 12 years now. And, um, and it seems that the most useful way is the way that we teach dependent origination within the practice of meditation. And that talks about it in a middle way. And this is interesting because the Buddha chose the middle way. We hear a lot about that. If we decide to talk about dependent origination, the middle way, all of a sudden, within the framework of daily life, real-time events, we're talking about uh, a phenomenological examination of one phenomenal event at a time, like me and you getting angry with each other. And all of a sudden, this is something that you and I can relate to right now in this life. So if you have a problem with anger, um, one of the ways to understand it is to start to learn this to understand how to deal with it, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this as we build the, our own chart of dependent origination and talk about some very simple definitions we've come up with that hopefully you'll be able to kind of retain um, as we build this chart, okay? So we're going to build, build one just like we built in our other classes, and we're going to flip this over right now. And we have these little stickers which are going to represent um, the different links as we go along. So the first link we're going to talk about very briefly is ignorance. And this is the first one. We're going to call it yellow. I'm going to put this over here for now. And ignorance basically comes from the word to ignore. Okay? So we say a number one on our little thing and we write, we label this one ignorance. What ignorance actually means you are it comes from the word ignore. So the question is ignore what? So what we are ignoring we are ignoring the four noble truths and the impersonal process of de dependent origination. Oh, I want to I want to say one thing here that's very important when you you're ignoring the four noble truths and the impersonal process of dependent origination and you don't see the three characteristics of existence. So we can add that one. We don't see the three characteristics of existence. Okay? So our next one that we're going to use, we're going to make the next two of these are going to be orange. And we put them 
on our page. Now the second one is called formations. And it's only important for you to understand what formations are. We, um, there are three kinds of formations according to the Buddha. The first kind is a mental formation, thinking. The second kind is verbal. And the third kind is bodily or physical formation. So what are these? Mental formations are thoughts, verbal formations are uh, language talking inside your mind or actual speaking and then bodily are physical actions that take place. The um, physical formations are sensations that come up in the body that you experience that way. Okay. Now the thing about this is these two links are important to understand. Both of these we're going to put up here above. They are potentials. They are potential links. They are potentials because we cannot immediately see these links in our um, in our uh, meditation. We shouldn't struggle to try to see these links uh, that are potential links. Eventually in the meditation, naturally as it develops, you will have the experience of seeing these uh, come up. It's not something that you never see. The second potential link is called consciousness. You want to put consciousness on here. And the, uh, that, that's the third, third link. And this is the potential for consciousness. This is where we talk about um, uh, the person has heat, they have vitality, they have consciousness. We're trying to explain, for instance, when we talked in class about the difference between a person who's dead and a person who is in Naroda Samapati. And the person who is dead has no vitality, has no heat and no consciousness. But the person who is in Naroda Samapati has no consciousness and no vitality, but does have heat still in the body, and then comes back. And so the person isn't dead, okay? So the potential for awareness is what this consciousness at this point means. And this consciousness then comes up later in the links as we go down the line, which we'll see in a minute. So we want the next color, and we're going to use green. And the next one, there are... Um, for these links. There are four green ones, and these are the impersonal links. We put these labels on them for a reason. You'll see in, as we go along here. So number four is called mentality and materiality. The easiest way for you to think about this one is it is the mental process of each sense uh, door and it is the consciousness that happens within the sense door, okay? So you have the mental process of each sense door. And then you put a line, and the materiality is the actual physical sense door. Now, if you look at this, the one of them, the mental process is the um, external up, where up above you have the um, the external and then you have the internal. That's that's how this is working. All right, external goes here. Well, I'm doing. I'm going on the other one, aren't I? And the internal. This is talking about the sense doors. Okay. The six sense doors is the next one right here. I'll show you how that works. Now what you need to know about the sense doors is interesting. The number five link is sense doors. Number six link is the contact. Now, with the six, the six sense doors, I want you to draw a line, see my line like this, so that you're 
this external and internal is over where the sense doors are, okay? With each one of the sense doors, let's say what the six sense doors are first, we have six, five externals, one, two, three, four, five. These are eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, okay? And then with each one of these, there is an in, uh, the, the, um, the internal is the sense door itself, plus the external is the sight that is out there. So each one of them has, the eye has a sight, and if you do this very carefully next to this other one, so you're going to keep writing across, you have the eye and sight, you have the ear and sound, you have the nose and odor, you have the tongue and taste, you have the body and tangibles, that's touch. Okay. Now, down here, when you draw a line, there is an internal sense door. That's the sixth one, and this is mind. Now, this is interesting because if you go up to the top of your page for just a minute, I want you to write something across here. This, is, this whole thing is the, the impersonal process of dependent origination. Okay, and that equals the line of human cognition. That's what we're actually looking at. How do you cognize your experience in this existence? And this is according to the middle view, according to, so I put like under here, according to the phenomena, uh, the view, the middle view, a middle view, let's say it's a middle view, just to be clear, it's an idea, a middle view of phenomenological, phenomenological <laughs> events. So we're looking at one event at a time when we examine this. And uh, the meditator observes by practicing a mind yoga. Now, what do I mean by the, this, the meditator practice, observes this through a mind yoga? Well... In the time of the Buddha, they practiced a body yoga, and they practiced all different kinds of yogas for uh, the idea was to put enough pain in the body so that the mind would be all that was left for you to look at. You could wake up the mind by putting enough pain in the body. Uh, but the Buddha took another tact, and when he left torturing the body and stopped starving the body and was healthy and well-fed and balanced with good exercise and everything and ready to go in to do his observation, he found that his practice was actually a mind yoga of watching mind. So how do we get rid of these other sense doors is if I explain to you when you practice your meditation, you close your eyes and that secludes you from sights. And I tell you that when you practice with your ears, with sound, you hear a sound, it is just a sound. It is not my sound, it is a sound. And when you have any kind of odor that you come across, that is just a odor. It is not my odor, it is just odor. And if your tongue tastes anything, um, hopefully you cleaned your mouth out before you <laughs> that in meditation, but if you have a bad taste in your mouth, you don't take notice or get involved in it because it is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself, it's just a taste. And the body, you're sitting very, very still. And so 
there isn't going to be a lot of tangibles. There will be sensations that arise, but there's not going to be a lot of movement and feeling and touching of things with the body. So you're very still. That's why you're still. And the mind is what is left to observe. So this becomes a mind yoga. And in Kashmir, they, ta they talk about how um, he practiced a mind yoga. Very clearly they talk about that. So, so you have the mind and thoughts. Or, you, you know, we say mind object. We can say thoughts or mind objects is how it is referred to in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Now what happens? How do we see? How do we hear? We like to use the eye as an example. But you have the eyes and you have sight. And then what happens is there is eye consciousness. And I put an I see, okay, underneath it for eye consciousness. Here's your consciousness now. Your consciousness is going to function. The potential of it is going to function inside each one of these sense doors. So you're going to have the eyes and sight plus eye consciousness, the ear and sounds plus ear consciousness. You're going to have nose and meets the odor and uh, nose consciousness arises, you see. You're going to have the tongue hits a flavor, a taste, okay, or a flavor, and the tongue consciousness arises. And you're going to have the body and tangibles and the body consciousness arise. And the mind and mind objects would be if you're sitting there just reading a book or knitting or anything you want to do. And a thought comes up. Your mind met a mind object. And then mind consciousness came up. Okay? And the way it works in the text, we say the I meets the color and form or the sight, and eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three equals eye contact. This is how you get your eye contact. So now you write across under contact. This is how it happens. And the ear hits a sound. Ear consciousness arises. There's your ear contact. Okay, and when those three come together, there's your nose contact. And there is where your tongue contact happens. And there is where your body contact happens. And there is where mind hits a mind object, a thought arising, and mind consciousness comes up. All of a sudden, there's mind contact. Okay, so that's how your contact is happening. Now, the seventh one of these is called feeling because with this contact as condition feeling arises so this one is called feeling and there's three kinds of feeling we can teach with two or we can teach with three but the three kinds of feeling are painful pleasant or neither painful or pleasant, okay? And the next, this, this one that is feeling, I was going to show you, actually, this little guy is split in two. And so what we kind of do is rip one of these in half, okay, just a little bit. And the reason I'm doing this, I'll, I'll explain this in just a little bit, but the reason that I'm doing this this way and making feeling two colors is because <laughs> when I grew up, I um, actually knew some people that just took everything just the way they were. So some people are not taking this uh, personally at all most of the time. And some people are taking feeling very personally. And on the top right here, I want you to label, starting with mentality, that these are impersonal links. This one is impersonal. Sense doors are impersonal. Contact is impersonal. And feeling is impersonal. We label that one too. Okay? Now, when I say this, what I mean 
is you can prove this to yourself because one of the things the Buddha said is don't believe me. Just believe what you can see and understand for yourself. Okay, so if you're sleeping and you have a body and it has six sense doors in it and you wake up before you open your eye, do you decide what you're going to see and how your eye is going to operate? You don't. <coughs> you don't do it, do you? Okay. So if you were to watch any animal or any being, you will see that the being has the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and they don't make it happen. So when you start to spend a little time with your sense stores, this is one of the exercises we like to encourage people to do, go out for a day and just Notice how your eye operates. Pay attention to it. How something comes into the peripheral over here and all of a sudden you see it. You don't necessarily plan it. The point is the, it's part of the body. The sense stores are part of the body and it's an impersonal function. Okay? When contact happens, that is part of the process of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching something and even thinking something, it starts that way. And that's how contact happens. When a feeling comes up, initially what happens with this feeling is it is just a feeling. This is new ground in a way because some, uh, some say that the feeling is the same as emotion, but the Buddha was very clear that the emotion doesn't happen until a little bit later. We're gonna see that right now. So number eight, Number eight is craving, and it's a real impersonal, a, a, a real important link because this is where personality hits. This is where it becomes personal. Everything here becomes personal. So from here on out, these are personal links. You can even put an arrow right like that. These are personal links, okay? Right to the end. These are the personal links. The thing to remember about craving more than anything else is craving always manifests as tension and tightness in mind and in body. Manifest means that it comes up first. It's the first thing that you notice. Okay? And it is, if we draw a line, then we say it's the I like it, I don't like it mind. And in the text, it explains to us that the very first place that I personally get involved in the line of cognition is at craving. It's where I jump in. I, me, my, and mine. It's where I begin to believe what's happening is happening to me, and it's mine. And if that's true, psychologically, it must be my fault, and I'm to blame, and it goes into guilt, and it goes into remorse. It goes into all kinds of problems because of believing that this is a personal thing that is happening, okay? So we say that it is the I like it or I don't like it, mind. It's, it's kind of what you feel in your mind. And what this translates as is attachment. If you like it, you want it and it jumps you over into the next link, or it's aversion. I don't like this. I don't want this. I want to make this stop. This is what happens to us. It's happening very quickly. Number nine link is called clinging. And clinging is where you talk about is this we do it this way just put story it's the story the ideas concepts and imagination about why you like or dislike like or dislike so what happens is something you you go, in, you go outside and um, you see a, um, a 
a beautiful rose with your eyes. The eye sees color and form. Eye consciousness comes up. There's eye contact. With contact as condition, feeling arises and there's a pleasant feeling. With feeling as condition, craving happens and there's an I like it. And it immediately goes into clinging. I like it because my mom said pink roses make my wife happy, so I'm going to pick them. So this is jumping into the next one. Oh, your habitual tendency is that you would want to pick it, and then you actually pick it, which is the birth of action. So here we slipped into number 10 link was habitual tendency. And this is just a term that we chose that makes this a little easier to understand when you're watching this in an event than if I told you this is where being happens or um, existence happens or the re those terms didn't quite make the students understand easily enough what was happening there because in clinging all these ideas are coming up into your head and then what happens is you go into <laughs> your little we say your personal library you have a little library in your head. It, it's there because of the way you personally grew up. Everybody's library is different. Um, but it's like a little uh, library of reactions instead of responses. And these just happen in life. When, like we, you and I talked a little earlier about somebody having a problem with anger, well, what do you do? And the person has to first see what is systematically happening in anger management of what happens and a lot of times in a coupleship or a relationship uh, somebody will do something it can be something very silly in the relationship it just really irks the other person and every time the person says it or does it or leaves something around the wrong way the other person reacts the same way every time. And this becomes a cycle that's happening and there seems like there's just no end to it. This is what we mean by habitual tendencies to make an assumption and act before having information about it. And if we see ourselves, we, if we keep a little notebook around and write this down at the end of the week, if we have a real problem in a relationship, sometimes we can identify whoa, I am doing this every single time. This happens, I do that. So the way out is to realize you have this, this uh, tiny little library here um, that is your personal little place, okay? And you make the decision, I am going to close the door. I'm not going to use this anymore. I'm not going to react anymore. When you do choose one of these reactions, the next thing that happens is the action has to happen. And this is where we call this the birth of action. Now, normally with an untrained mind, this is the birth of reaction, <laughs> okay? But it, the actions the Buddha described as three kinds of actions are going to happen. There's three kinds of actions, and they're the same as what is back here in formations where we have a mental action that will happen where you think, gee, I'm really mad, okay, and then you verbally say something to the person and then you physically or bodily uh, do something. So what you're looking at here is we've heard it sometimes in this country when we've grown up as please guard your thought, your word, and your deed. That's the same thing as we're talking about here. Um, and these are all, again, these are all the personal links, the links that you take very personally. These links are what make you feel that the world is on your shoulders, that everything is happening to you instead of from you. You see what I mean? Okay, the last link is called Aging and Death. And it took me a while to figure out this is sort of an acronym for what's really going on here. It's been abbreviated over time to be called aging and death, but what it really means is aging 
And what happens with the aging is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And this is where um, you beat one's breast and cry, and these things that are described in the texts. Weep beating one's breast and um, become distraught. This is the stuff that's being described in the text. When we take things personally here, and what is this personal nature? In Buddhism, the word atta and anatta are talked about a lot. And over time, we've called this no self. But in reality, if you call it no self, what's it really mean? That you personally disappear or I'm gone? It doesn't mean that. What it means is look at your life with the consequence of no self being there. Things would become impersonal. Things could be taken impersonally and you wouldn't always assume somebody was saying something to you or at you personally. They would just be speaking to you or saying something and it might all be about them. It might not be about you at all, you know? So this is what's happening with the, um, the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair as we're taking things very personally. If we let this go and change our perspective, uh, then we are l letting go of the personal, we wouldn't personally sorrow, we wouldn't personally lament, we wouldn't personally suffer the, the pain, suffer from the pain. The painful feeling could happen, but we could let it go. Grief, when it happens, the process could be much shorter with an understanding of how it actually happens. Okay, so that's one of the things. Now, looking at this whole picture here, we need one other piece of information we have to keep in mind. When you suffer, what it is that happens, that the, what makes the suffering happen is taking everything so personally. And um, it's a good idea to stop for a minute and look and see when I have things come up in my mind, if I'm suffering from depression, for instance, what is it that's coming up in my mind that is triggering this, this uh, depression to happen? And what we need to understand is down at the bottom of your page, I want you to just put an asterisk like this little guy here, and then draw a line to the middle. And in the middle, I want you to put like a little donut that's around this um, uh, this line and then pull the line over to the end of the page here just almost and then you say death at the end with another asterisk. And the first one is birth okay and this one in the middle is the present moment it's a little I had this little thing where I was going to draw a little cute package and put a little bow on it because that was my present moment <laughs> okay and uh, sort of wrap it up you know with a little ribbon here <laughs> like that okay anyway that's your present moment over here before your present moment back to your birth that part is called the past right so just tell me what's true about the past go ahead and tell me What's true about the past? Your son comes to you and says to you, what's, Daddy, what's the past? What's true about the past? It happened. <coughs> what else? It's not happening now. Right. Can I change the past, Daddy? I don't think so. Can't change it. Can't fix it? It's done? Done. It's done. It's gone. So that's the past. Now, over here, everything from the present moment to death is the future. Now tell me, what's, what's true, Dad, about the future? Hello? It has not happened yet. So what is it? What is it? What's it going to be? We don't know. We don't know what it's going to be. This is really interesting to me because I spent a large part of my life really, really getting upset about things that happened in the past 
and having having emotions come up and getting them almost like born again and suffering from them. And then the future, I would just dread the future because I worried about it so much. And then someone showed me a thing called chi and they said, you know, each, each day that you live, you are given um, one little measuring cup like this of chi, which is energy, life energy. You have a choice in this, um, what you're going to do with this cup of energy. It's great. Most people take one third of this and they give this energy away to the past. And another thing they do is they give another third of it away to the future with their worries about it. Okay. And then they end up coming home at night and saying, I'm too tired to go for a walk. I don't want to do anything. Let's just go to bed. <laughs> I'm so tired. I can't do anything. Because why? Because they're playing around with one third of the energy they were given for that day. And they couldn't make it. And it's pulling a lot out of us because we are not understanding. Let the past go. Let the future go. And then come into the present moment and take a look at how lighter everything is. Now, I told you when we started, we are going to look and see how does that wheel turn. So the question is, can we see? Can we see how the wheel turns, where the energy comes from? And what happens is when you look at this chart, if you'll just label it for me, um, where you, the contact is, you say, that's where, let's look at this, the analogy from the point of view of a car, okay? We walk out with the key and we put the key in the car and that's contact. When we turn the key, we start the engine and that's where a feeling comes up. Okay. First gear is meant to just start that, that big car rolling and what jerks it forward is craving. Second gear, what it does is it starts it moving along and getting more complex and complex. In Buddhism, we have the term vitaka, vichara, papancha. And the, the uh, vitaka is where you start the engine. The vichara is where you uh, start it rolling, moving. And then where you turn this into a big thing is clinging. And then third gear is where we pull out what we're going to do as a reaction really fast. And you picture this car, this fourth gear. <laughs> fourth gear is the birth of that action. So picture the car going down, and it's going to pull onto a, an expressway to drive. So you put the key in, you start it, you go first gear, second gear you're going up, uh, up, up that ramp, Third gear, you're going down the ramp. Fourth gear, you're on the highway and you're zooming along. And then the car gets out of gas. You are run out of gas. That's what happens to every single event that is happening to us using dependent origination. This is what is turning this wheel. And the suffering is described as the sorrow, the struggle of the sorrow the lamentation, the pain, the grief, the despair, the dislike for what is happening, the desire to change it and not accept it as it actually is. And what happens is the anxiety, the depression, the um, panic, obsessive compulsive behavior, the anger, the sadness, all of that happens to arise in this position in this new chart, where did I get one of those new charts? Do you have one over there? Where we made a new chart for you to um, see because this is the one that we work with all the time with the students. This is the most important part of the chart that we can watch. See, when you finish the chart, you actually have 
you can take it and fold it. You can say, well, here's ignorance. That's there. Now I'm not going to be ignorant. I'm going to learn about this, all these pieces, okay? So we have these two potentials. We don't have to worry about trying to see them or learn, you know, see them. We know they're there and we understand them. This is where we fold these guys like this. Now we learn about what we're made of, these impersonal pieces that operate so we can see and live and hear and taste and touch in our universe, in our, in our life. And then the last part are the pieces that we put on this shorter one here, showing you contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies, birth, and then where the suffering lies with the definitions. So I want you to have one of these two to keep with you so you can see that. Now, did the Buddha find a solution for this? That's the big question. Did he find a solution where he could solve this problem and get you out of this so that it's not just spinning, 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 spinning? He did. He did. He called this right effort. And he had a skeletal structure underneath all of the meditations done anywhere, basically, are made from this right effort. The intention of every kind of meditation is to move us towards more calm, happiness, peaceful, balanced living where we're, we're just happier, you know, and we are able to have space to come up with creative solutions when we get rid of the tension and tightness. So what he did was he figured out a way to present uh, to the person four steps. And the four steps were, first of all, be able to identify in your mind when there is an unwholesome mind state. This unwholesome mind state is identifiable by this tension and tightness that arises in the craving when it happens. That is the symptom we're looking for. That is what we're learning to detect. As we sit very calmly, do we feel an increase in tension as we start to think, worry, try to investigate, over, over analyze, that kind of thing? Do we feel this tension happening? That's considered the unwholesome mind state. So we have to let go of that and he figured out that if you relax all that tension with an additional step after the releasing step, that you are letting go of this more completely. And when you come back and continue the meditation, you have less tension than you had before. We used to show this um, as a demonstration with uh, two glasses of water. Do you remember that? We used to do that and show how the water keeps going down, 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 down in the glass until we reach cessation and then go out and come back and experience the final stages of the meditation. So what we've done here is the students actually in 2005 at the Joshua Tree Retreat came and said to Bhante, you know what we're doing is we are actually recognizing when this tension and tightness is there. We are releasing whatever arose and letting it be there without our mind's attention on it anymore. Then what we're doing is we are relaxing any excess tension and tightness and we feel relief happen. We feel it right there. We begin to become sensitive enough to feel the opening of mind and relaxing of it as it opens up and then we re-smile. Why? Because if we smile, it lightens up our mind. It lightens up our mind and it also turns out to sharpen our awareness of this happening in the next cycle. So we re-smile and return together to the object of meditation and then as it's needed we repeat the cycle. So actually these six piece steps here are actually the four steps of this right effort, which is a very harmonious practice. And if we can learn to do this, what can happen is really neat. The person who is at work can use this in their daily life by becoming aware 
if they are doing a chore or a task, any kind of task, and then all of a sudden something comes into their mind and it starts pulling their attention away, then they can let that go and sort of laugh at being caught again. As they laugh and smile a little bit and put their attention back into what they're doing, what happens is they become more productive. They become more relaxed at what they're doing in school or at work or at home. And this becomes something that's very, very applicable in life. This becomes something that is not isolated anymore uh, away just on the cushion at a particular location or just something that we go and do at retreat. This becomes something that you use the retreat for honing your observation skills. So what the Buddha is saying here, he's saying that meditation is observing the movements of mind's attention, moment to moment, object to object as it moves. And he's telling you that mindfulness is remembering to do that observation all the time. It's real exciting because we see how people change with this. And if we look at this, look at your little chart, this one. You have this one, right? Okay, here we go. You can have that one. This one has one example on it at the bottom, which is showing you just what happens with somebody who's angry. And um, this came from a little story where there was a woman in an office, and every Monday the guy, the boss came in and was very upset with her when he read the report from last week. And she was feeling very bad because he was getting so upset every Monday morning and it happened the same way every week. And she decided to go away and learn to meditate to try to help her from, keep her from quitting her job, just so she could calm down a little bit. And someone started to teach her how this works and when she went back after a while she looked at the man and she didn't see someone getting angry at her anymore. She, because she learned this process, she began to see a man who was in pain, who saw something, read it, and was in pain. So his eye met something with color and form. Eye consciousness arose. He made contact with the information on the report. It went into his mind, and what happened was he had a painful feeling. <laughs> and when the painful feeling came up, he didn't personally like it. She could see him change with the tension and tightness in his body and knew that he was about to, he didn't like it because of some reason, and he pulled out the reactive habitual tendency where he was going to yell at her and walk out of the room. And she said, well, wait a minute. And he said, what? Why don't we go get some coffee and talk about this report? Because honestly, you don't like it, and I don't like it. The point is, we could change it so we both like it, and you don't get upset on Monday morning anymore. So it gave her the courage to see him without reacting to him and getting mad back at him at all as co more compassion. It opens the doorway by understanding how this works, is how the Buddha was opening up the doorway so that compassion can begin to operate. So dependent origination is not something to keep in the closet, and it's not something to just say we can't talk about it. I think we have to keep bring it to the surface, we have to re-examine it, and we have to look at other ways of dealing with it so people can actually use it in their life. And people can very, very easily use this contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, and birth of action, and realize what the suffering was, and they can change the way that they approach the world. So the only other thing I have for you is I have this little list and anybody who's watching can go to the dhammasukha.org website. If they contact me, I will give them the papers we're using in this program so that they can 
see the links and have the, these are the poly names for the links, so you can keep one of those. And not everybody wants to have a Sunday school method of doing it this way, but when you make your own chart, you have your own chart. And you can tack it on the wall and think about it a little bit and begin to understand that this was something that was very much not theoretical. It was not mythology. It is not philosophy. It's very scientific. It does work. And it works not only with a man's mind. It works with a woman's mind. It works with anybody's mind. Buddhism is really something that is asexist when you talk about how this all works. And what we're interested in, what the Buddha was interested in in the texts, was really understanding this and learning how to let go of it.